All right, well, it's 2.05, so I don't know, Kevin, if you want to get started, if you're ready. Yeah, we can get started. Um, so, hello, everyone. Welcome to the HSDA Red State Organizing Panel. My name is Kevin Kim, and I, along with two amazing Red State organizers, Sophie Lee and Sam Dobson, will offer some insight and discuss how we as youth in red states and or conservative areas can effectively organize and mobilize. So before we dive into our panel today, I'd like to just give a brief overview of what our panel today will consist of. So first, we'll introduce ourselves and just offer some background information about our roles within HSDA. Then we will move into a roundtable discussion and talk about some effective strategies we have personally utilized when organizing within our own states. We'll also be answering some questions submitted to us beforehand by youth across the nation. And if we have time, we'll try to open the floor to questions from all of you. I'm also excited to say that we will have two phenomenal speakers joining us later today, both hailing from red states with very unique stories. We'll try to have Q&A with them as well. Um, just depends on time. So think of some questions you'd like to ask them while listening to their stories. So now I'll hand it off to Sam. Yeah, so hi guys, my name's Sam. Um, if we haven't talked before, uh, just to tell you a little about myself. I'm from South Carolina. Um, I've lived here my whole life and have kind of grown up in the political culture that is the South, um, which often isn't much of one. So I hope that I can um, kind of share some of my insights and story and uh, get to know you guys a little bit better as well. Yeah, um, and thanks, Sam. Um, so hello, everyone. As I previously mentioned, my name is Kevin Kim, and I'm from Louisiana. I joined High School Democrats about three years ago, and this is my third summit. This past year, I had the honor of serving as HSDA's first ever Red State Coordinator on the national staff and as the chair of the Louisiana High School Democrats. And I'll now hand it off to Sophie. Hey, y'all. My name is Sophie Lee. I'm the current chair of the Georgia High School Democrats. I've been involved with HSDA for about two years, but this is my first summit. I found out about high school Dems through my local community chapter, the High School Democrats of Gwinnett County. All right, so now we're going to be having our roundtable discussion. As Kevin mentioned, we'll be answering a few questions we received from HSDA members located everywhere from California to New Jersey. So the first question, I'm sure that young people, even those living in red states, probably support policies that are far more liberal than those supported by voters and elected officials in red states. How do you prevent young Democrats from losing hope when the candidates they can support tend to be much more moderate or conservative? And yeah, this question comes from Milo from California. Um, so just to dive a little bit into this question. So I'm from Louisiana and, and our governor is the only statewide elected Democrat um, in our state and he is a pro-life Democrat. So this stance uh, has actually fractured a lot of Democrats within our state and the more progressive and liberal side of the Democratic Party um, tend to lose hope and tend to lose motivation to work on his campaign and tend to um, not want to vote in the election because they feel like neither candidate um, helps them in terms of their issues and what they truly believe in. Um, but in many cases such as this, um, in red states or conservative areas, you will have a lot of moderate Democrats run. And even though they may not support uh, everything that you support, and even though they may disagree with you on some key issues that are um, core to your heart, I really think that, um, in, especially in red states and conservative areas, it is very important for organizers to be able to um, not be one issue voters. And so with John Bo Edwards, for example, he was being, um, he was, his opponent was Eddie Rispone, and Eddie Rispone, his opponent was simply running on the platform of um, supporting Trump. He didn't really have any new ideas himself. Uh, all of his ads were, I support Trump. John Bell Edwards is a liberal dog for Nancy Pelosi. And so in cases like this, um, especially with the coronavirus now happening and with healthcare and education on the line, with so many other th important things on the line, uh, having someone like Eddie Rispone in office, that can really take your st uh, state a huge step backwards. And so I feel like it's very important that Yes, it is okay that we had differing views, and I'm not trying to undermine um, anyone's views on abortion. Um, and of course, like the women's right to decide what they do with, uh, with their bodies. But I feel like that uh, oftentimes we, we are too focused on just a core issue that we just turn um, aside from a Democrat and we 
we basically are turned off from that Democratic candidate. But without them, um, we really can't take that step forward. So I believe it's really important that we need to take the tiniest of steps, in, especially in conservative areas where Democrats can't win. We need to take the tiniest of steps forward so that we can eventually take that next step forward on those issues where we may differ um, from our candidate. Um, and I'm not sure if Sophie and Sam want to chime in, but I guess we'll move into our next question. So this question comes from Carter from Louisiana. Do you think it's important for progressives to have as much of a say in a red state as moderates, or will that alienate voters who are on the fence? Which is more important? Yeah, so I can kind of start the answer for this one. By the way, if anyone has any like comments or um, questions during this, it is like, you know, we're open to discussion. If anyone wants to add something, please, please feel free. Um, but yeah, as far as progressives and moderates and red states, I feel like um, it's an important perspective to um, realize. I kind of just want to tell a little bit about my personal stance and also um, why I think, you know, realizing a distinction is important. So for me, I think like progressivism is super, super important on, you know, the national level and, you know, all in, in all states. But I think it's also important to realize that often like uh, candidates that would be moderate in, you know, on a national level are extremely progressive on a state level, um, like the one that, I, I brought up before is Jamie Harrison in South Carolina would, you know, nationally be considered a pretty moderate candidate. Um, he's, you know, definitely has a lot of moderate stances, but, you know, having a Democrat period is, is, you know, an extremely progressive stance in, you know, red states. And I think making that distinction is really important that, you know, moderate candidates can be very progressive choices. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other comments um, or thoughts about like progressivism and um, you know, moderate candidates or progressive candidates or anything. No, if not, we can kind of um, move on. I hope that I'm not pushing anyone's voices um, out of the conversation. Um, I just, you know, I think it is important to recognize, um, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, all candidates who are Democrats and red states, but yeah. But yeah, I think for our final question, um, we have what tangible resources do red states, do red state organizers need that blue state organizers take for granted? Um, and this is from Jason. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and start answering this. Um, just from my personal experience, I've recognized that in blue states, there's a much more prominent culture among high schoolers of just peer support and a lot of political activism and involvement in political activism. So that's something that I think is not necessarily, I guess, encouraged in red states because whether it be our school administration or just within our communities, leaders often tend to support their conservative or just Republican views, said frankly. But yeah, peer support is just a huge integral part of encouraging my peers to get involved with political activism and getting my acquaintances involved. And I mean, obviously, keeping myself motivated, too, because activist, activist burnout is very real sometimes, and especially when you don't have that strong base of supporters and people around you who share similar views or just want to support the same things that you do. It's really hard to keep yourself up and really continue pursuing those goals that you as a high school Democrat want to continue and, I guess, allow to manifest throughout our society. And of course, if anyone wants to add anything, you can go ahead. I just wanted to add something really quick. This is sort of unrelated, but also like just remembering like all of this can be applicable to any of you guys, whether you're from like, you know, like the red state distinction is, you know, I think there are red areas in plenty of states. Um, and a lot of us feel, you know, feel a lot of these similar struggles, whether we're from the South or North or otherwise, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely resonate with that a little bit because I live in Georgia, which is red state, but then I live in Gwinnett County, which is a blue county, and then I live in Suwannee, which is a red city. So it's like all these little like bubbles and categories that make it really hard sometimes to navigate the political arena in our community. So this is definitely not a unique circumstance because it happens all across our, our all across our country. But yeah, as Sam was saying, this is applicable to so many people. And I hope that this really does resonate with a lot because we collectively can make so much of a difference. And just using our backgrounds and these unique circumstances in red states or blue states, it's just so important that we come together through opportunities like this summit to voice our concerns and find similar people so that we can work together and work towards our common goals. 
Yeah, and also just one thing to add to that. For example, um, my, actually my political journey uh, here in Louisiana started off with me knocking on doors for a Republican candidate because oftentimes in places um, such as where I live, there are no Democrats running. And so that type of opportunity isn't always there for um, Democratic organizers. So I think one thing to really note is that, you know, blue state and red states, I know high school Democrats in the past have tried to do um, partnerships between states. Um, you know, it's always beneficial if we give each other resources, give each other opportunities to campaign for Democratic candidates all across the United States. Um, just any, any opportunity is, is a good way that is a good thing to share with our red state organizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess if anyone, does anyone have any other comments or thoughts, or I guess we might even have time for like one short question. Um, I think we're running a little bit quick. Um, does anyone have any thoughts or questions? No, well, I guess if we don't, if you guys don't have any other comments, we can kind of move into the training portion and just spend a couple extra minutes there. Um, I, I do point. have a question. Yeah. Um, I live in like East Tennessee which god bless is not not particularly democratic it has does not have any plans to be anytime soon um but even uh, because i also live in a particularly majority white area so and middle class ish leaning toward like there's a very there's a very large gap where i live between kids who send their children off to like college tuition level private schools to people whose public schools haven't been fixed since the 1980s like there's like a huge gap there and i know kids on both ends of that spectrum and it typically does end up being the kids who go to the super expensive private school who hold the semi more liberal beliefs but the kids who i think i would find like it's hard to convince the kids who would be the most affected by a lot of democratic policies and the most helped by them to do anything in that issue. They tend to be the most conservative for some reason. I'm homeschooled, so I have like, I have a really hard time. I'm running a local community chapter. So I have a really hard time getting to anybody in any public school. Um, and I have a really hard time with the apathy that most everyone has. How do you kind of like get past people who are leaning left, but are also incredibly, incredibly apathetic? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think that's something that's <laughs> like so incredibly common, um, you know, all across the country. Um, I think for me is just like, you know, staying, me personally staying political act, politically active, um, like every day of the week helps like, you know, my friends get involved more as well. Like, you know, I think, if you can sort of like set an expectation for people to be politically active around you. Um, I think that's a great way to start, whether that's sharing resources or texting your chat or holding friends accountable, whatever it is. Um, but I also know it's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to add to that a little bit, like, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement really taking a hold of our society these days, you see a lot of your peers and a lot of people you wouldn't really expect posting about it or just really being vocal about it. But I think once we start talking about issues that pertain to all of us, regardless of our race, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, whatever, anything that pertains to us, that's when people will start listening. Because once we start, I guess, focusing on the issues that we as Democrats want to alleviate, like police brutality or racial injustice, that's when people start caring. So not... I guess like social injustice is not necessarily a partisan issue. I mean, it's obviously a human rights issue. And once we start emphasizing that, especially using this time of turbulence, I guess, to bring that to light, that's when we can really start changing people from being apathetic to more empathetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just like to piggyback on what Sophie just said and give another great example um, with the Parkland um, shooting that happened that's when my peers who were usually apathetic to any type of issue, um, that's when they woke up and were like, hey, that could have been me. That could have been us. Um, it's kids just like us who got shot because we have a gun issue in this country. And so just having those conversations, um, the way that I had my local chapter run 
um, we, yes, we try to work on campaigns, but we also devoted a lot of meetings towards having conversations about issues because a lot of times um, your peers might not always be educated on issues, but they want to. Um, and so part of apathy is just being uneducated on these issues and it's okay to be uneducated, but just having this conversation, sitting down, listening to their problems and listening to what they believe on these issues is really beneficial to try to uh, spark some interest um, in more apathetic peers. Yeah, so I think um, I think we probably should go ahead and move on to our training stuff to stay on schedule. Um, but yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so we can move on um, to the connecting with your state party portion of the training. So one big thing that can help boost your legitimacy um, is to get your state chapter or your local chapter connected with your state party or your local party. Um, so one big way to get connected um, with your state party leaders is to network at party functions. So um, your party should be running events throughout the whole year. Some include fundraisers such as the True Blue Gala in Louisiana, GOTV events with party leaders or forums, um, whatever that the state party is running. Always try to stay connected and keep up to date with events that they're running on their state website or their Facebook account. Um, and for example, in Louisiana, the biggest way that I networked with my state's uh, executive director, my state's governor and the state Democratic Party chair was going to these events and just showing them that we exist and we're here. We're not here just to phone bank. We're not here just to knock on doors, but we're also here to do way more than that. We can organize and high schoolers are capable of doing more. And persistence is really key to this because um, oftentimes you might not get your emails answered. Oftentimes you might not get a phone call back but just staying persistent throughout the process and following up, um, that's a big way to show them that, hey, you care, you're not here just to send one email, you're here and you want them to be, uh, to include youth as a voice. Um, and also just a reminder to keep your etiquette and keep professional um, when contacting them. Uh, persistence doesn't always mean um, that you, can, <laughs> you have to be rude, you can always keep it professional while being persistent. And also one big thing is to research your party leaders. Um, look, for your, look for their communications director. L look for the people who had, um, whose job is to liaise with high schoolers across the state. Um, you know, just generally knowing uh, your party leaders, being knowledgeable of that can take a big step in showing them that you're legitimate and you're there um, for serious, uh, in a serious context. Another thing is local committees and parties. So a lot of your counties and parishes might have their own little party or their own uh, executive committees. This is the best way to actually network with people within your own communities and your own neighborhoods. Um, these are Democrats um, who may live right next to you, five minutes away, 10 minutes away. Um, and this is an opportunity to network with them. So uh, when they have meetings, try to go to those meetings, bring your friends there and um, ask if you can speak to um, everyone there and tell all the Democrats who you are, um, where you're from, what school you're representing or community you're representing, and tell them that you are there to help, you wanna help out, um, you wanna seat at the table and have a voice in um, any procedures or uh, uh, stances on issues that are going around in your communities. Um, and also, you know, you can even try to get seats. So for example, uh, Louisiana High School Democrats, we have two seats at our state central committee. Um, and that actually shows that our party cares about our voice and that we actually have official seats at the table to present our stances on issues. So that's something that you can have, but you know, try to get that, you need to have an ask. Never be scared to present an ask to your state party leaders, because even if they're rejected, um, at least at least you'll know um, what their stance is on that issue. Yeah, and I think uh, Sophie wanted to add something on party functions. Yeah, so um, what my county does is we host an annual Blue Topia Gala, which just allows state leaders and um, county leaders, especially, to network with not only constituents, but also high schoolers like us. And I saw that someone dropped in the chat that high schoolers should volunteer at these functions. And that is a great idea because what I've noticed is that seats at these galas tend to be like hundreds of dollars for some reason. So if you volunteer, you basically get like a ticket for free. Maybe that's a unique circumstance, but yeah, that's just what I've noticed. And just to add to the finances aspect of connecting with your state chapter in order to just forge that connection, um, we have a connection with our Young Democrats organization, and that allows us to use their act blue for all of our finances. And that just makes things a lot easier than going through some process of like registering ourselves for some sort of bank account or just anything along those lines. And then next up, I'll be talking about grassroots mobilization in red states. 
Um, first and foremost, the most important thing you should be doing is communicating with all sorts of people. So this can be gauging interest within your community about issues like racial injustice, climate action, and period poverty, which is what I'm going to be referencing throughout my training session. But yeah, you should also be reaching out to local businesses, organizations with similar goals, and media outlets just so that you can get your organization or your team's name out there and make it known that you want to make change as a high schooler. Um, just to go over a very quick way of contacting local press. So the first thing you should do is pick an appropriate outlet. So in my case, let's say I'm organizing a fundraiser for period poverty, then I want to be reaching out to my Gwinnett Daily Post, which is my local media outlet and contacting a journalist that best meets my needs. So that can be anything from regional to just general and calling and emailing them to make sure that you can be in contact. Um, you want to make it brief but concise, uh, call at a convenient time if needed because the journalist may be busy and it's 100% okay if they don't respond right away. Um, try to set up an interview just so that you can, I guess, put your thoughts into it, put, put your goal in your own words, plan out what you want to say because you don't want to go in just with nothing prepared. It's okay if the conversation goes off script because the journalist only tends to use around 20 to 40% of what you say. and yeah, debrief and de-stress after you're done talking to a journalist or any sort of media outlet just so that you can get any pressure off your chest, anything that's been like, I guess, putting a weight on your shoulders for whatever, how long, however long. So yeah, always talk to someone afterwards. And then the second step in grassroots mobilization is collaboration. So when you're organizing large scale events like rallies or marches, it is imperative that you reach out to any and all organizations within your vicinity that have similar missions or messages that they want to amplify. So for example, when I was organizing my city's national period day rally last year, I was tasked with contacting organizations like Planned Parenthood and Georgia Stomp, which are both organizations that lobby for legislation pertaining to menstruators rights. So after you do that, be sure to advertise your event on community-wide platforms, whether it be things like the Nextdoor app or Facebook groups and pages. But also be sure to use inclusive vocabulary. Um, don't try to, I guess, what am I trying to say? Like word your event in a way that only caters to one audience. Be sure that it's all inclusive. It invites everyone and yeah. Final step is action. So always have a backup plan and be positive regardless of the outcome because you never know whether it be inclement weather or just a less than satisfactory audience turnout. You have to be mentally and physically prepared for any of these outcomes. Um, be prepared to answer any questions throughout the duration of your event that someone may have about, your, about the event or the goal of the event and know who or what you're representing. Don't forget to praise yourself and your team afterwards because you worked really hard for this. We, everyone knows that organizing any sort of large scale event requires a lot of time and energy and patience. So be happy, be proud of yourself and celebrate and reflect on what you can do differently to host an, an even better event next time. Um, finally, I want to emphasize, like I said before, that social injustice is not a partisan issue. It's a human rights issue. Grassroots movements begin with this low nut that was mentioned in yesterday's leadership training. And they go hand in hand with a lot of the legislation that we as Gen Z care most about. These movements only grow stronger, sorry, with the support of high schoolers such as the High School Democrats. So yeah, now on to Sam with some organizing tips. Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of bring a couple of my um, general like uh, random tips that I find really helpful when organizing. Um, the first one is, is organizing around your events that you have. I think it's really important um, when you, you know, to make a calendar, uh, to make a calendar, or whether you're doing digital organizing, um, or communications, or whatever it is for, you know, maybe you have a local chapter, maybe you're working even for a campaign, it's really important to organize around your events, and spread those events around with your friends. Um, that can be really helpful, especially if your friends are involved, that can be a great way to get someone involved, maybe invite them to a digital house party, or whatever it is. Um, and then second, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about relational organizing and relational strategy, which is kind of, um, in my opinion, one of the you know most important aspects of organizing and campaigning. Um, so it's important to have one-on-ones with people that you're working with, whether that's volunteers or people on your team even. Um, it's really, really important to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. Um, I put a couple of tips here that um, from the D from a DNC resource. Um, it's, you know, here it says rarely over the phone, but obviously right now all of them are going to be over the phone. Um, but it's really important to go into these one-on-ones to have a purpose and know what you want to get out of this volunteer, out of this, you know, teammate. 
and uh, you know, go into it having a plan and then come out of it you know, knowing what the next steps are going to be. Um, and yeah, relational st strategy other than having one-on-ones with people and one-on-ones with friends and others also encompasses having, um, you know, incorporating the connections that you have on your, your snowflake, your branches, whatever it is, um, incorporating those into your own organization and into your own events that you're having. Um, it can be really important to, you know, go to other events and go to other organizations to rep what, what you're doing as well. Um, but yeah, and then the final thing I really want quick, quickly wanted to talk about is political organizing, or sorry, I meant this should say political directing, um, but political organizing, same thing basically. Um, but yeah, no, I wanted to talk about what it is. Um, so political organizing is, and directing is kind of what Kevin and Sophie talked about a little bit, um, especially Kevin, you know, getting to know your state party, getting to know um, campaign people. It also means getting to know, you know, organizations. And one of the tools that can be helpful if you're, you know, getting started and, you know, you're making your first contacts and are trying to compile a list of, you know, the connections you have and um, is, is power mapping, which is something that um, I use sometimes. You can make a little chart and just write names down. Um, and it has, you know, people who you think are going to strongly support you or not support you as much and people who might have more resources or less resources. And that way you can kind of map out so that way you know who to go to for what event. Um, and yeah, that's, that's something that I find really useful for um, organizing political connections. Um, you can also use a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet or both. Um, but yeah, I know we're running um, maybe a little bit, actually we're kind of on time. So yeah, I think we're gonna, um, if no one has any questions really quickly, um, I think we're gonna move into our panelists, um, but yeah. Yeah, so um, our first speaker today will be Stephen Hanwerk. Uh, he was originally part of the Stonewall Democrats and he worked to promote pro-equality leaders and policies, but then he thought that the state party needed a change. And so now he's the executive director of the Louisiana Democratic Party. Oh my God, I am so inspired by sitting in and listening to the last uh, uh, 15 minutes. Um, you guys are freaking amazing. Uh, Kevin, I can't thank you enough uh, for inviting me to be part of this. I am more than honored. I'm humbled and uh, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to maybe contribute a little bit of, of uh, what makes me me and perhaps uh, some of the great things that we've been able to do, uh, but only uh, with the leadership of folks like Kevin uh, and like his predecessors uh, in high school Democrats uh, here in Louisiana. So. Um, I'm the longest serving executive director of a state party in the nation uh, right now. Um, I don't think that that's anything that makes me special. As a matter of fact, I'm, I, it makes me sad, actually, uh, that we don't have more longevity uh, out of executive directors. I think it's because of my experience and because of building the relationships uh, that I have uh, that I've been able to form such strong alliances uh, with our high school Democrats, with our college Democrats uh, throughout the state uh, that has only made us stronger, I think, as an organization. It has only helped us navigate some times that, quite frankly, were difficult times. So I want to kind of go into, I've, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about my story. So um, I got involved in politics, uh, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Um, when I was young, um, seems like 100 years ago, um, I was discriminated against in the workplace. Um, I was targeted um, and ridiculed, made fun of openly in front of staff that worked for me. Um, by a boss um, that uh, didn't like my sexual orientation as if that was something I could change uh, for her. Um, and it was at a time where there were no protections anywhere in the country uh, for uh, folks like me. And so I felt compelled to get involved to change that. I didn't want to have young people to have to go through and navigate the complex world of, of having to deal with that along with everything else, along with trying to make a living, along with trying to keep up with my academics, along with having to uh, um, mature and grow and become an adult, right? Um, it was hard enough than having to deal with something like that. So I got involved in politics. I started paying a lot of attention 
Uh, I ended up moving uh, here to Louisiana and um, about 24 years ago, I believe now it's been. Um, and I started getting involved in campaigns. I mean, I first just started volunteering. I started making phone calls, knocking doors, getting to know the candidates, getting to know the positions that they held. But then I felt a national calling. Um, I felt that we were being let down by the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was letting down the LGBTQA uh, community as a whole. And I wanted us to be better because we are better. Uh, we are better than that. We had to have a better stance on employment non-discrimination. We had to have a better uh, stance and an inclusive stance on marriage equality. We had to do better on a national level. So that's where I decided to focus my time. Uh, was on national politics. And I ended up uh, associating with and uh, joining an organization called National Stonewall Democrats that was started largely in a response to log cabin Republicans uh, who uh, were mainly just apologists for their party, uh, uh, constantly apologizing for their stances uh, for our community. And we were able to really do some big things. We were able to change a lot of institutional programs inside the DNC to make the DNC better on LGBTQIA uh, issues. We were able to really lean in hard and provide pressure, provide um, a constant face, you know, showing up at the meetings and making sure that we couldn't be ignored. We ended up becoming very good friends with the then chairman, former governor, uh, Howard Dean, who helped us a great deal at modernizing the Democratic Party, helping us build inroads to national conventions so that we could influence the party platform on these issues and to really make some ma massive change. Well, in about 2008, 2010, we started to realize, well, guess what? The Democrats have done everything we've asked them to do. Uh, they've modified their policies. They've gotten better. And all during that time, I was serving in leadership at the state party um, here in Louisiana. And I found that we were actually getting worse. Democrats in Louisiana were actually getting worse or certainly not evolving. And so then I decided to focus my efforts on the state party. And from 2010 until 2012, I worked on recruiting progressive candidates to run for party positions all over the state. I ended up, uh, I was really good friends with our then DNC committee woman, uh, Karen Carter-Peterson, who was a brand new state senator at the time, um, and convinced her that I had the votes uh, that we could actually elect her, the most liberal senator in the state of Louisiana, representing the most liberal district in the state of Louisiana as uh, the party chair. And we were successful. Um, we were very happy with that. Uh, and then somehow I got talked into becoming the executive director. And really why I wanted to tell you guys that story is it was not easy. Um, it was not easy making those inroads. Um, imagine uh, many of you uh, being rural folks or in red areas of the country. Um, I wanna really focus in on some things, some lessons that I've learned that might be helpful to you. The biggest thing that I found was that we had a situation where we were a very rural state, a purple state at best, arguably a red state. And what we found was, is that a lot of folks took major issue with having the most liberal senator as our state party chair, and then the um, a gay man, uh, the first openly gay executive director that the party had ever seen, I do say openly gay, um, but um, that was a, an issue. And a lot of times people were scared to death that we were going to somehow be these pinko communist folks that were going to make it impossible for people to associate and carry a D beside their names. But we didn't do that. Instead, we focused on core key issues that voters care about. Um, like increasing minimum wage, like equal pay for equal work, like restoring funding uh, to our higher education that Bobby Jindal just decimated uh, our universities throughout the state. And also we wanted to increase funding for K through 12 through our public schools in which we really believe in and we felt had been giving, uh, had been constantly being eroded by Bobby Jindal and all of his uh, antics and 
friends. So by being able to focus on those issues, yes, I happen to be a gay executive director. Yes, we happen to have a pro-choice uh, state party chair. That doesn't mean that we weren't able to work with our folks and be able to provide a positive message that Democrats from all over the state, including Democrats in rural areas of our state, could actually back, could actually get behind, and could actually really embrace uh, the messaging discipline that we had. And guess what? We were able to do it through lots of folks like you guys. Uh, lots of folks like our high school Democrats and our college Democrats that were able to help us connect with individuals that could help shape the message. And so the biggest piece of advice that I can give you guys if I boil it down is be sure to lead with values conversations. Be sure to begin the conversation, even in the most red of red areas in the country. Lead with your values by being able to say that I don't believe that a woman should be paid less than a man doing the exact same job. I don't believe that in this day and age that $7.25 is a livable wage. I don't believe anyone can live on that. And here's how I know why. I know why that is the case because we are seeing people who are working two full-time jobs getting paid minimum wage that are also still qualifying for food stamps. There's something wrong with that. And why should we be subsidizing businesses? Find a way to have these conversations on values. Don't necessarily lead with the great big D, right? Don't necessarily lead with your blue jersey on. Okay, lead with values conversations and you will be surprised how many people will open up to you, will listen to what you have to say and will want to join with you in trying to solve the problems. So um, I'm checking my notes here really quick. Um, I'm hoping uh, that um, we can further extend uh, our relationships with you guys. I really wanna be able to help any of you guys that might be struggling in connecting with your state parties, in forming really strong alliances with your state parties. I think the ideas that were already shared about big events, uh, big um, uh, things that the state party is doing by you guys simply volunteering to help out um, is something that's huge and is something that I as an executive director need. And in return for that, we'll make sure that you have access to the events. We'll make sure that you get introductions to members of Congress and all of our leaders so that you have a voice, so that you're able to connect with those individuals and hopefully inspire policies that will be better for you for your generation that we all agree with. So um, hope that was, uh, was what you guys were hoping for. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or whatever Kevin has in store for me. Thank you, Stephen, for your um, great story and for your great advice. Um, if you guys have any questions for Stephen, uh, please save them till the end. Um, I will now pass it over to Sophie to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, so thank you so much again, Stephen. Um, next up is Carolyn Bordeaux, who is Georgia's seventh congressional district's Democratic nominee. In 2018, she um, she had she was within 433 votes of winning the seat, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. But this year, we're coming back stronger than ever, and yeah, I'll just pass it on to Carolyn. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Look at you, Sophie, so that, yeah, okay, because I, I can't see everybody on this, the way it's set up right now. Great, okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, Sophie just helped with that race, which I really appreciate. Um, I just uh, cleared out of a six-way primary uh, with a 41% vote margin and really great in Georgia. About 85,000 people voted in this primary. That's up from 30,000 in 2018. Uh, which itself was a banner year, and uh, of the 85,000 that voted, 50% have never voted in a Democratic primary before. Um, and this was driven by, well, fo first, um, folks like Sophie making thousands and thousands of calls, <laughs> which I really appreciate. Um, but it was, you know, it was a lot of young people turning out. Um, so it's people your age, uh, but also this district is sort of the northeastern suburbs of Atlanta, and it's a lot of families. It's a lot of uh, parents with kids are kind of, you know, what makes up this, this kind of area. And it's a suburban area where we are really seeing a lot of change nationally um, and, and turning towards the Democratic Party. 
So just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I have really spent my entire life in public service. Um, when I graduated from college, I was pretty broke, had a lot of student debt, uh, but I was really committed to public service. I was like, what can I do? Um, so the first thing I did was I went to Washington, DC. I was like, okay, I'll just start working for members of Congress. Um, and so I went, just not went door to door to different members and anyone with whom I had some connection, I would say, you are my Congressman, hire me. And eventually my grandmother's Congressman scheduler me the chief of staff of Ron Wyden from Oregon. And I ended up working for him. I started with him in the house and then he ran for the Senate. And so I went house and then, you know, switched over. Uh, so worked uh, in both chambers at the national level. Um, after that, I went back, I got a master's and a PhD in public administration uh, with a focus in public finance and came to Georgia State, uh, the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies to teach there. And I've gone back and forth since being there. Uh, one of the things I love is working with young folks like you all and helping you find the right path. Um, my background really is in public service. And so, you know, I'm able, I talk to young folks about all sorts of different opportunities, um, either working in public administration, which is kind of in the government itself, working in public policy, working in public finance or budgeting, um, or working in more of the political advocacy um, campaign type world, uh, which often kind of crosses over into nonprofit advocacy. Um, so that was kind of my day job, but also I uh, went out and I would do various public service projects. And one of the really big ones was that I was asked by the leadership in Georgia to come help them balance the budget during the Great Recession. And uh, my background is public finance. And so uh, I spent a lot of time working with folks in Georgia, helping them figure out how to get through uh, a really tough fiscal crisis. Um, then I went back to the Andrew Young School and I founded the Center for State and Local Finance, uh, which again was really devoted to bringing along the next generation of young people who are going to be working in various roles in public service. So that's kind of been the trajectory for my life. I got into politics uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, and there, there are many, many sort of angles, many facets of this shift that's happened. Um, I'd always been sort of behind the scenes working on, you know, policy guidance and educating young people. Um, but a couple things really changed. Uh, the first was what happened with health care and the Affordable Care Act and the, de the destruction uh, of that piece of legislation. And really, my background is in public policy. And so I just saw, you know, all around me was policy malpractice. And I just couldn't bear to see it. I was so sick of it and sick of, you know, people taking policy action that are just really hurting people badly and not seeing an effective response on the other side um, to counter that. And then uh, I woke up on November 9th of 2016 and Donald Trump was elected president. And I was just like, you know, I am not gonna go down this way. I stand in front of my students, you know, every day. I tell them if they don't like what's going on in this world, they have a responsibility to get out there and make some change. And so I, I kind of took my own medicine and uh, got into this race for Georgia 7th. And this was a district uh, that was held by a four-term Republican incumbent who'd never gotten below 60% of the vote. Um, it was a district that was considered, you know, pretty much impossible to flip. But, you know, if you get together with a lot of good folks, I called a lot of my former students. They came and helped work on the campaign and helped us put it together. Um, it was a really a long shot race, uh, but with a lot of hard work, we closed a 20 percentage point gap and I came within 433 votes of flipping the seat. Uh, now I'm back. Uh, we have another amazing team of great young folks who are helping with the race. And again, we just cleared out from under uh, a six way primary and uh, are turning our eyes now to November and trying to make some change there. Um, how much time do I have, Sophie? Um, we can go on for like a couple more minutes. We just okay. want to, after this, we're just going to close. Okay. Okay. Well, I just thought, you know, since, since there's a lot of young folks, sort of di different roles that you can play, you know, if you want to make change. So, um, in one of the, the last classes I taught, there were four young men who sat on the front row and, um, they were like, Dr. Bordeaux, how do we change the world? And so this has kind of been partly as I'm running for office, I'm working on answering that question for them. But you know, there, there are many ways, there are many paths um, to you know, being leaders to make change and running for office and being politically involved you know, is certainly one of them and one that where we do really need people stepping up. Um, it's extraordinarily hard work and you know, it is, it's very demanding to do these kind of campaigns. 
Um, but that, that is certainly a way you can make a difference, um, being involved in campaigns. Um, one thing about campaign world is that, you know, campaigns are gritty work. They are knocking on doors. They are dialing, you know, to, to call, talk to voters. They are raising money. Um, it's not glamorous work. Um, policy world work, also something I really love, um, is a different kind of universe of things that you can go into. And there um, you are really kind of, you know, thinking about public policy deeply, thinking about the problem and how you get to a solution um, and, you know, writing the policy briefs and things like that to do that. While that's the fun intellectual work, you know, the grit of a campaign is what allows us to actually achieve the beautiful policy briefs and all of that good work. So it is not, you don't have as direct an impact um, as you do if you're in campaign world. And last, I just want to talk briefly, there's a, there's a host of administrative type roles um, that you can be in uh, where you can really affect tremendous change. A lot of my students, for instance, they might be interested in criminal justice reform or in higher education reform, and they were really pulled towards nonprofit advocacy. But the person in Georgia um, who has some of the most influence over criminal justice and how our, our system works is, is, like, is the executive director of our Department of Corrections. Um, and so just to think, there, there really is a vast universe of ways where you can affect policy and affect change in people's lives. And uh, just challenge yourself um, to, to, to go out and talk to lots of people um, about how you could make the change that you want to see in the world. So with that, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you so much again, Carolyn. Um, I dropped it in the chat, but if you guys want to get involved or just want to learn more about her campaign, um, you can go to carolyn4congress.com or just contact me via social media, phone number, whatever. So yeah, thank you again. And yeah, we'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right, good. Thanks so much, y'all. Take care. Yeah, um, and if any of our uh, members and attendees um, have any questions they want to ask, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. We'll try to have about five to six minutes of questions and then we can close afterwards. Any questions? For, for us, for the panelists. Um... Yeah, I have a question. So first of all, thank you to both of our speakers and to all of us, you know, everyone who's been running this webinar. It's been very amazing so far. My question is really basically just about kind of the shifting tides and shifting sentiments in a red area. And, you know, if you guys recommend or care more about gradualism or care more about really sticking to what you believe. And we did talk about this a little bit earlier when the presentation was being made, but, you know, especially now when things are very polarized and a lot of people have very strong ideas that they care about, you know, some of them might be more radical, some of them might be more centrist. Do you think that it's most effective to really just kind of stick to flipping a seat at all costs, even if it takes being more moderate? Or do you think that people should stick to their beliefs more? I'm happy to talk a little bit about that because we get that a lot in terms of, you know, where, where do you stand? Um, I think the important thing is to, to think about where we want to go. Where do you want, you know, a community to go? And it's about listening very carefully to the people in the community um, and trying to understand what it is they need and how do we solve that problem? And one of the things I see a lot, and I faced myself um, as I've run in various, you know, I've run four races now in a few years, is people start with the policy solution um, instead of sitting there and just listening to people and saying, you know, what is it you need? Where do we need to go? Now, I came into this with some ideas because I clearly I was very, very, you know, very upset about the direction um, that we were headed in many ways. Um, but part of the exercise of the campaign has been to, to think about, you know, carefully about how do I help people? How do I turn, you know, the concerns that I see, do they resonate with the people, he, you know, that are my neighbors and my friends and the people in the district? Um, and so I think if we get bogged down in that bigger debate, um, you know, is it single payer or is it, you know, uh, Affordable Care Act or the public option, you know? And when I talk about those issues, I'm like, look, and it actually goes to Stephen talking about values first. Everybody needs affordable quality healthcare. That's what we want. 
All right, we can figure out different ways to get there, but let's not get bogged down in that. You know, that's, we're gonna have to go through a whole legislative process and hash it out and see what we can, we can develop. But that's, our eye is on that guiding star. And, and, and if we can keep our eyes on those guiding stars, then, then we don't get bogged down in kind of the, that sort of left, right uh, dichotomy, you know, which most people just don't care about. They just wanna be able to see a damn doctor without going bankrupt. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's how I see and perceive it. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I, I completely agree. I, I think that when you lead with values conversations, you're going to be able to get a lot further with individuals. Um, but when it actually comes down to movements, right now we are at an inflection point. Um, historically, you know, I got to tell you, um, uh, being able to see the national shift that we had um, solely on marriage equality, that was one of the things that I don't think our nation had ever seen. For the population to literally flip within a decade um, of its opinions on that was nothing short of miraculous and historical. We're now at another inflection point, I believe. Um, and it's important for leaders to lead, but you lead by listening. And I can't tell you enough that I've really valued those individuals that were putting forward information about how to be a good ally. I don't think it's going to shock anyone on this call that I'm probably not the best voice to lead a conversation on why um, we need to be better on racial issues. I can't say that I've had been racially discriminated against in my life. I've led a life of white privilege. I know that now, but I'm learning what that white privilege has meant and how that has had an effect. So we have to be better allies of the people that we're standing up for. That doesn't mean that I should be the one leading the parade with the blow horn in my hand. It may, may mean that I need to have conversations in rooms that others may not be welcomed in. We have to use our relationships that we build in order to keep pushing for the change that we need. Um, and so that's what I would encourage everyone to realize is, you know, I came from the activist standpoint and I fully realized that by getting involved in party politics, I was going to have to use my indoor voice, but that I couldn't be any less of a fierce advocate by being in the room as I was being outside of the room yelling in. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you so much. much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're running out of time, but if it's okay with everyone, we can go like maybe three, four minutes a bit, but we have two questions and I think that's all we have time for. So Sean, if you could go ahead and ask. Hey, first of all, thank all of you for setting this up um, and getting to talk to us. It was really educational. Uh, my question is really simple. Uh, it's Dr. Bordeaux, for example, you stated that like once you found out that Trump got elected that you said you wouldn't stand for that. And then that led you to run for the seventh district. Uh, but what do y'all do personally to keep yourselves motivated and to not focus on the negatives, especially like in the middle of possibly a long process, whether you're trying to get a law passed or whether you're in a campaign, what do you do to motivate not only yourself, but other people uh, that are helping you? Um, that's a, that's a great question. So I, there are several things in there. One is every morning I wake up, I look at the news and I'm motivated to keep going. <laughs> so it is, you know, one mess, one horrible thing after the next. We have, you know, coronavirus, we have the fight for racial justice. And, you know, that, that definitely keeps me going. Um, but one, of the, one other thing you talked about is, is the struggle for change and how long it takes. And, you know, Stephen was talking about this inflection point. You know, I started working on marriage equality issues actually right out of the gate when I was with uh, uh, Ron Wyden. And that was back when even people we thought of as very progressive um, would not support uh, you know, what was called gay marriage. And, um, you know, and I, it was funny because uh, one, one funny story I had was I was a young staffer for him. And uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, you know, I need you to write some talking points for Ron on marriage equality. And I was like, okay, well, wh what's his position? And as the chief of staff, it's like, I don't know, just put down whatever you think is right. It's like, well, okay, you know, marriage is about love and commitment and therefore I support gay marriage. 
And the deal was, it was like this young person, you know, just like you guys, and nobody had a chance to look at the talking points. And they, they call me into his office and he's on the phone with the reporter. And I can hear the reporter say, you know, well, what's your position on gay marriage? And he looks at me and I slide the talking points in front of him and he goes, well, of course, marriage is about love and commitment. <laughs> I support gay marriage. And he became actually one of the first members of Congress, one of the first senators, he was running for Senate at the time, to ever support marriage equality. Um, but it's been a long journey, right? <laughs> it was a long, long journey from that point um, to, to where really the whole country, you know, the whole country now recognizes that. Um, and uh, just be, you know, there is some, you're an advocate, but also always, you know, do, do recognize what you're doing a lot of times is putting out those ideas and pushing and pushing. And then all of a sudden there's something in the political culture. There's something that turns, you know, we're kind of seeing that hopefully around racial justice and equality, you know, there's this trigger, this turns and all of those ideas that have been waiting out there and pushing and pushing all of a sudden tumble, you know, into, uh, to being enacted and into the public space uh, in a way that they were not before. So, so recognizing the pace of change, it's often slow, it takes time, but what you're doing is pushing, pushing, recognizing that that moment is gonna come where you're gonna be ready to make the change um, that, that you have been advocating for. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're going to be taking one last question just before we close and that will be Sasha. Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. It's an honor to be able to speak with you guys. Um, so I live in North Carolina, which is one of the most prominent swing states. And I've tried a lot of things to show that young people's voices do matter and make a difference, including spreading the fact that everything's at stake this election. And even though I live near Raleigh, which is a fairly blue area, I'm having a hard time getting more people on my side. So how can I further promote teen activism and involvement in politics, even though I might be the only one standing for now? Yeah, look, Sasha, that is an amazing question and one that, quite frankly, I think we all struggle with, if we're being honest with each other. Um, and sometimes when we're so passionate about things, um, we, we need to build the coalitions. First off, my strong recommendation, if you don't know uh, Meredith Cuomo, you should. Uh, she is the executive director of the North Carolina Democratic Party. She has become a very good friend of mine. She is a phenomenal fundraiser, and boy, does she get it. Um, I'm more than happy to help introduce you or uh, help have some of those conversations to facilitate those. And the same thing for anyone uh, right now. If you need help reaching out to uh, your state party and getting some time. Um, and, and, and I would say engage with her. Find out what you can do to be helpful. Here's the other thing, though. And I want to really strongly encourage you guys for this. Don't allow yourselves to ever be pigeonholed into the, well, there are texters or there are phone callers. Your guys' opinions matter. You should be at the table. You should be helping drive policy. You should be helping make decisions about the campaign. Carolyn brings up an amazing point uh, that she just, that decision was made by Senator uh, uh, Ron Wyden because she was in the room because she showed up, because she did not censor herself. She actually put together a, a reasoned uh, answer and it was the decision that he made. That is how decisions get made, guys. And we need you in the room. We need you part of this conversation. Don't allow yourselves to be put off in a corner just to send text messages. You guys are so much more valuable than that. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, I'm about to share our closing screen just so you guys can um, have our contacts and anything else that you might possibly need. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. Ooh, thank you guys again so much for, um, thank you to the panelists so much for coming and thank you to um, everyone who attended. Um, but yeah, any final words from anyone? Yeah, um, thank, thanks again to uh, Stephen and Carolyn for coming and um, inspiring us youth. And thank you to everyone who came out to the panel today.